Next section is we're going to talk about um, angular kinematics, and this is really where we talk generally when we speak about human motion. Um, and you describe something you see, you generally spend a lot of time talking about angular kinematic com contests. Um, and so we'll understand a little bit about what those are going forward here. Um, but if we can look at, at these images, and, and typically um, from a angular kinematic perspective, we're going to talk about joint angles and, and how different body parts are being positioned through the process. Um, if we were going back to the linear kinematic piece, we would make sure that we would look at all these guys as, a, as an individual point. Um, and, and we would talk about their center of mass motion throughout. But typically, as when we would talk about the difference between each of these time points in, in body positions, we may talk about knee angle or positioning of the trunk or positioning of the elbow um, or arms throughout the motion. Um, and these are all going to be in, in difference in the foot at foot contact. These are all different examples of angular kinematics as well as if we talk about the position of the bike a lot of times we'll talk about the way the trunk is positioned um, is there more inclination or is there a greater angle of the trunk um, also hip flexion and knee flexion and where is the positioning of the foot um, and through the process um, so these are all components that are taken into account for angular kinematics um, and angular kinematic concepts so before we go any further, let's just quickly discuss and, and talk about um, some definitions and what human angular motion is. Um, so angular motion um, is when all points go through the same um, angle, but therefore different distances depending on where they are on that, on that um, object um, in the same amount of time. So um, things that are closer to the axis of rotation will go through a, a smaller angular distance. Uh, or angular displacement, um, but those that are further away with a greater radius from the axis of rotation will go through a longer distance in the same amount of time. And that's very important to understand. Uh, but as we talk about human motion, it's more of a general motion. And that's a combination of this angular and linear motion. Um, and of course, the, the linear motion is this translation piece where we just go from A to B in a linear line. So the person started from A and ended up finishing at B. But throughout the process, the body went through some sort of rotation, which all points and the body did not go through the same um, distance in, in travel, but they all went through the same angle of motion. Um, so understand that human motion is a general motion where it combines angular and linear. Um, we do that through the portions of rotation and translation seen. So there's two broad categories when we talk about angles, and we touched on these previously. Um, the two major components that we'll, we'll, that we'll see and, and we'll use, and, in, and I'll expect you to be able to talk about these both using both terminology. But a relative angle is also known as a joint angle, and it's known as joint angle because it's referred to as joints, knees, ankles, hips, um, elbow, shoulder. And, and what, it's, what it is, it's, it's a joint or an angle that is formed by true segments. Um, so you use, and it's called relative because it's relative to where the positioning of those two segments are. Um, and the calculation for this comes where you take the proximal, or in this case, the thigh, and you subtract the, the shank angle, and then the angle is the one that is created between there. Um, and so what happens is in order to get the, the proximal and distal segment angles, you have to come over here and understand what an absolute angle is. And that is also known as the segmental angle. Um, to where you're identifying the position of that particular segment um, in space. Um, and typically what we do is we, you need to first identify a, a reference line. So if I take my thigh again, um, a horrible drawing of a thigh, but what we typically do is we take um, a right horizontal, um, typically from the distal end, um, and then we'll calculate the angle at which that is relative to that. So this is the theta that we'll look at. And we'll calculate that angle of the thigh. So if I have that angle of the thigh, and then again, I take in there and I put in um, this angle of the shank. I calculate that angle. Um, and so this would be the angle of the shank relative. And then if I calculate those two and subtract, then I would, I would come up with my relative angle or my knee joint angle, which is the included angle here. And this is the relative angle of the knee. So um, segmental angles or absolute angles are. Now, one of the things that, let me backtrack, 
one of the things that's very important is this absolute or segmental angle. Those can be with a different reference. So sometimes you'll see a vertical reference line, or sometimes you'll see a proximal right horizontal. Um, but what you'll often see is when we do that is we make sure we identify what that is so you know. Sometimes you'll see the trunk seen from a vertical because then you see um, the um, vertical going backwards or forwards, anterior tilt or posterior tilt of the trunk relative to that vertical component. Um, but these are showing you a little bit more of how these are calculated. And again, this is um, what I just showed you here on the bottom with calculating the two segmental angles. And then once you would calculate those angles, you would get this joint angle or knee angle in between. Um, and so here, the depiction of on the left-hand side is the same exact component. Um, so these are the two different angles, relative, absolute, or joint segmental, um, and understanding how to calculate. Now, I will tell you for my classes, I don't typically have people calculate them. But you need to understand how to do it and the process and what they mean. Um, it's very important to understand that a relative angle, I could have the same knee joint angle and have completely different positionings in space um, or segmental angles in my thigh and shank. Um, so that's a, a very key component of this. Depending on what your question is and what your task is, um, it may be more beneficial for you to take the segmental angles of the thigh and the shank versus taking um, the knee joint angle. So depending on what your question is, that can dictate what type of uh, angle of kinematics you're discussing. So again, here, this comes down to it, right? So we have the, the runner and we can discuss this runner in, in multiple different ways. Um, on the depiction on A is the um, relative or joint angle methodology where you have the angle of the hip, angle of the knees during stands and swing phase, elbow, and then on B, you have somebody who is looking more at the segmental. So they're talking about trunk inclination. They're talking about thigh angle through the motion. Um, and this one's in swing. Or they're talking about the shank um, angle. And if you look at this one, this looks like the shank angle from the left horizontal of the distal um, because of the direction of which this person's running. It makes sense to do that. So sometimes you can, and, and again, all you gotta do is say, hey, I'm gonna do it this way because I wanna know what that angle is relative to the horizontal because they're traveling from right to left instead of left to right. Um, so this is how you would utilize both types of angles to describe the same motion differently. Okay, depends on what your research question is. So going forward too, it's very important to understand what the degrees of measurement are or units of measurement are for our angles. And there's three basic that we're going to use um, understanding degrees, radians, and revolutions. Um, revolutions are often used in gymnastics um, or some kind of um, adventure sports. You'll see a lot in skating, a lot of um, in skiing, um, ice skating. So those things use a lot of revolutions. Um, but they also talk about degrees a lot, um, a 720 or, or something like that. Um, but you could also break it down to revolutions. Tires are often used in, in revolutions or um, something else. But degrees are what you're probably more comfortable with or what more experience with and understanding that there's a 0 to 360 unit um, of the degrees that go into effect. Um, and understanding that 0 and 360 are the same number, essentially, um, but 360 you go around one full revolution. One thing you may not be most familiar with, but you should be and will be following this class, um, are radians. Because radians are going to be the method at which we prefer our angular kinematics to be measured in. Um, because there's a portion of this class where we're going to transfer the angular kinematic piece into a lin its linear kinematic analog. And for that, you need radians. Because a good thing with the radians is radians are a unitless number. Okay, And what that means is that once you calc use it to calculate with some distance, you just have the distance concept. So this is a very important concept. Um, understanding that one radian equals 57.3 degrees. Okay, so this is a uh, radian is simply um, equal to the arc length of um, the circumference of the circle that's e uh, equal to the radius. And we'll go ahead and talk a little bit about that here in a few minutes. Uh, but the circumference is, is 2 pi r, that's 2 pi radians, and that is 360 degrees. So this just shows you the ratio between each of the um, components up on top. 
So the next component we're going to talk about is the right hand rule. And the right hand rule is um, a way for us to determine the direction of the angular momentum and um, the identify the third orthogonal component or directional component um, based off of the way our fingers and our thumb are oriented um, as we see the motion occur. What does that mean? Well, if we take the right hand and we take the fingers, um, so if we take this hand versus this hand, and we see each motion is going the opposite way. So if I look at A versus B, A is going in a direction of counterclockwise. Now, a side note is for angular motion, unless you're told otherwise, I always assume that counterclockwise motion is in the positive direction. So in 2D dimensions, if it's going in a counterclockwise motion, assume that that is the positive direction. So if I have a counterclockwise motion, assume that is the positive direction of motion. Okay, so that is something very important to go forward. Unless you're told otherwise in the problem, assume that that is the case. So now if I take these fingers and I curl them in direction around which the motion is going, the direction in which my thumb is pointing becomes the vector of two things, it is either the positive angular motion, momentum, or it is the positive direction of the third orthogonal component. Remember, so we're dealing with X, Y, and Z, and essentially what we're doing is collapsing your fingers in the X and Y coordinate system, and the motion, the point of your fingers is creating the direction of the Z component of that. Um, and so that's one direction of the way. And so if you look here, and in, on this other graph, here's C. So you can curl it and, understand, and see that the angular momentum and the Z component are all going in more of an, a different direction, not vertically straight, vertically up. And that's because the motion was turned to the side. So during human motion and um, activities, this is a great way to, to look and, and find out where that angular momentum is occurring and where that Z component is based off of where your planes of motion are within the joint or um, field of view. Now the length of this vector, because remember vectors have a quantity of direction, but there's also a magnitude component to it. So this magnitude component is given by the length of these vectors. So if I have a vector that's longer versus something that is, is shorter, you can identify what the magnitude of those are as well, the angular momentum. So now we're going to talk about um, the difference between positions, velocities, and accelerations from an angular, connect, angular kinematics perspective. Very similar to um, the linear components, um, but again, you'll have just a couple differences, and it all starts a lot with it's some of just the directional rules and the units of, of what we're going to use. Um, but here, let's understand that angular position is often um, abbreviated as theta, um, but understand that theta is a measure of the angle, and that could be in degrees, it could be in radians, and it could be in revolutions. So when you're asked, if you're ever asked what the units are for angular position, these are the common um, angles that can go through, that the object can go through. But position is basically the object's position relative to that defined reference system, whatever your reference system is. Um, and there's two different components, just like in linear, distance and displacement. Important to conception is distance is a scalar, so there's only um, a magnitude, there's not a directionality to it where displacement has that directionality to it because it's a vector quantity. So it's very important to understand that counterclockwise rule being positive. So if the motion is done in a counterclockwise motion, we assume that it's positive unless we're told otherwise. Okay, so what I wanna give you a little quick example of that, um, and what we're gonna do with this illustration down here is let's assume this is A, we're gonna have B and C, because what happens is this, first travels from A to B and the goes through 70 degrees. From B to C, it goes through 35 degrees, right? So if we're to look at this and, and talk about it from a distance perspective, it's a total path traveled. So remember, it's a scalar quantity, so there's no directionality to it. So it's simply 
70 plus 35 equals 105 degrees of distance traveled, angular distance traveled. If we look at this from a different perspective and we want to look at it from a displacement, then remember it's the final position, which is A, to, sorry, the initial position is A, the final position is C. So the position at A was zero degrees and the position at C was 35 degrees. Now the important concept here is going to be whether or not C is in a counterclockwise motion from A. And if we can see that, it travels this way. And that is counterclockwise, so it's positive. And so that becomes 35 degrees in the positive direction. So this is how you would use the same motion of a pendulum from distance and displacement from start to finish. Going forward, we have angular velocity. Um, and this is omega, rate of change of angular displacement. Again, we had the same units, so radians per second or radians per minute, degrees per second, revolutions per minute. So whatever your um, angle measurement is over whatever your unit of time measurement is. Okay. And again, we have the same concept where we have average versus instantaneous. If we want to know what's happening at the ith frame, we take the previous and the, the um, sorry, the previous and the following frame, and we use the two delta t because we know the frame rate, um, and we can calculate it that direction. Going further, we see the angular acceleration, and this is alpha um, rate change of angular velocity. Um, and again, we just have the same units of angle over the unit of time squared. And again, we have the instantaneous versus average. So the only difference with the angular acceleration and angular velocity are the units of, of measurement. And once we've calculated everything, we'll go from there, right? And again, we carry on the counterclockwise motion with everything because it starts with position, goes to velocity, and goes to acceleration because these are all vector quantities. Um, and what, what I really want you to be able to do is keep in mind that um, this PVA relationship and, and illustrating that can work with um, angular kinematics as well, not just linear kinematics. All that's going to happen now is that what you form your PVA relationship, it's going to be in angles, not in um, the linear motion. So I wanted to give you a quick demonstration of how to lay out um, an angular kinematic one. So one of the common things I'll have you do is, is look at um, something like a squat and, and show me the knee angle or I'll have you do a bicep curl and show me the curl of um, the elbow motion of the elbow during that and then calculate the uh, velocity and acceleration right so again um, most of this will always be um, time over here in seconds and that's just an easy one to go ahead and put in but you set up your graphs the same exact way um, and the difference over here is you're gonna have angular position um, and maybe we'll do uh, degrees because that's the easiest thing to do for this um, and then we'll have angular velocity and and we'll do degrees per second and down here you'll have angular acceleration and you'll do um, sorry degrees per second squared so uh, I wanted to show you this because one of the common most common things are going to be um, a lot of times people will get this degrees first um, in the first position and then all of a sudden they go like meters per second and meters per second squared make sure that you follow your units and bring your units down that is going to be the very important thing and, and an easy um, way for you to get this set up correctly um, but the other important aspect i want you to remember is what this means the origin and, and means of that position graph um, and if we're doing degrees that means zero degrees so um, understand that um, we're going to have a reference system for the knee, um, and, and what I mean by this is a fully extended leg, depending on what world you're in, could be zero degrees of knee flexion, but it could also be 180 degrees at, of the knee angle. So one of the things I'll, I'll be sure to do is let you know which your, what your um, your reference is for that, um, but understand that. So and let's look at the elbow. So I'll say a fully extended elbow is 180 degrees. Um, so you're going to start up here. Right. And so if I say full start with extension um, and then go through two ranges of motion of elbow um, of a bicep curl. Right. So maybe you start up here 
and you come flex go back up flex go back up right so understand that i have a little bit of space here now this person obviously or me obviously i didn't go um i went probably to like a 20 or 30 degree um so this is um this actually probably represents more like 45 um could be 90 whatever but understand that zero would mean that my forearm or my radius and ulna were connected to my humerus and, and we know that's not possible because um, there's some skeletal muscle tissue um, that is there that, that doesn't allow there's range of motion restrictions um, from biceps and, and tendons and ligaments that don't allow it um, so understand that if I if I say if I ask you to do this and somebody did something like this understand that that would be considered incorrect because we know that there's no going beyond that zero right and it should not it shouldn't approach it so this is one of those instances where um, you're setting it up at the beginning really determines what you've done um, and how you interpret the the data okay